Next, Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces. We again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Headquarters in his most famous cases of crime and murder, brought to you by the makers of genuine Bayer aspirin. Now let me tell you just who Mr. Chameleon is. Born of a well-to-do family and a college man, he tried from childhood to live up to the name he bore, Chameleon, by taking on the color of whatever situation in which he found himself, appearing in endless guises, Finally entering the police force where he became known as Chameleon, the man of many faces, the underworld's most dreaded man. Throughout this series, the listener invariably knows who Mr. Chameleon is, no matter in which disguise he appears. But the criminal he's tracking down sometimes does and sometimes doesn't. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Case of Murder from Across the Seas. While Beatrice Hart is known in New York society for her rare gift of making even strangers feel like old friends in her home, we find her now feeling a strange sense of foreboding as she receives a visitor whom her husband has asked her to see this afternoon. A visitor who now enters saying, Ah, Mrs. Hart, I'm Charles Van Vogel. It's very nice of you to let me come. My husband telephoned me that you wanted to see our Rembrandt painting, but uh, he's not home yet. He told me I might get here before he did... Oh, I almost forgot. I brought my friend Miss Carlyle and my nephew Jerry along with me. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? I presume they're interested in paintings, too? Uh, Lita, Jerry, interested in art? Uh, They're not interested in anything but themselves, are you, Jerry? No, Uncle Charles. Uh, Lita, darling, uh, were you interested in coming to see the Hart's famous painting by Rembrandt, or did you simply hate to leave me out of your sight? Oh, for heaven's sake, Charles. Lita and Jerry are so devoted to me, Mrs. Hart, so devoted, they even followed me from Paris. And I presume they'll follow me back there. You haven't been here in America for some time, have you, Mr. Van Vogel? No, no, I haven't, Mrs. Hart. I was born and raised here, and so were Lita and Jerry, but frankly, I can't stand most Americans. Really? Well, there are exceptions, of course. You are one. You're quite famous, Mrs. Hart, for your beauty and charm... You have not been overrated. Thank you. Your husband, too. I found him quite nice when I was introduced to him. And when I heard that he'd recently purchased a picture by Rembrandt, I couldn't resist asking him if I could come here and see it. It's in this next room. Would you like to see it now? You are a lovely woman. The kind a husband would never let go. The paintings in here. And if circumstances were different... Charles! Yes, yes, Leader, I know you're still here, as if I could forget it. Uncle Charles, let's look at the picture and get it over with. Uncle Charles, what's Uh, the matter with you? Charles! Mr. Van Vogel, what is it? Are you ill? Yes, I'm afraid so. All of a sudden, I have the most terrible pain. The most terrible pain! I I don't think I can stand it! Meanwhile, at Central Headquarters in the office of Mr. Chameleon, that amazing detective, that man of many disguises, and the underworld's most feared man, Mr. Chameleon is reading aloud from a newspaper while his colleagues, Madeline Evans and Detective Sergeant Dave Arnold, listen with varying degrees of interest. There's another juicy item in Ricky Rickerton's column. Ricky Rickerton? What kind of a name is that? (laughs) I think that's a charming name for a society columnist, Dave. Anyway, Ricky writes... um, Smart New Yorkers will be happy to hear that Charlie Van Vogert is once more in our midst. The international playboy is kicking up his heels and causing a lot of talk among those in the know. Oh, for Pete's sake, Mr. Chameleon, do you have to read that trite? You hush up, Dave. I'm enjoying it thoroughly. (laughs) You see, Dave, Madeline may be one of our best detectives, but she still likes to hear about the international set. Excuse me? Hello? Yes, Commissioner? What's up? Something big? Who? Yes, I know Beatrice Hart. I've known her socially for years. Very attractive woman. What? 
No. Oh. Okay, Commissioner, I'll be right there. Well, that's a nice little tidbit for the society columns. Charles Van Vogert just dropped dead in Beatrice Hart's drawing room. Charles Van Vogert? The man you were just reading about, Mr. Chameleon? None other, Madeline. The playboy to end all playboys. He died in agony, apparently from some sort of poison. After I see the commissioner, I'm going right up there to Beatrice Hart's home. Mr. Chameleon, it was like a nightmare. Here we were, this man I'd never seen before, and his friends, sitting here chatting quite casually. And the next thing I knew, he... he was dead. It was horrible. I can imagine, Mrs. Hart. Uh, by the way, where was your husband? He hadn't come home yet. He still isn't home. We called his club, the office. Mm. Beatrice! Oh, here he is now. Edward! Oh, Edward, I thought you'd never come. Oh, my poor darling. I couldn't believe it when I heard that you should have been here alone. I'll never forgive myself. Well, don't be silly. It's all right now that you're here. Oh, they told me outside, Mr. Chameleon, that you were on the job. Uh, yes, Mr. Hart. I spent so many pleasant hours here in your home that I hate to come here on police business. I'm sorry you and Mrs. Hart are involved. Oh, but not directly. I'd only seen that man, Van Vogel, two or three times. I met him in Paris when I was there last year on business. He was an American who preferred living in Paris. Uh, to be honest, I thought him a highly obnoxious character. But, Edward, why did you ask him to come here to our home? I couldn't get out of it, sweetheart. I ran into him this noon, and he immediately told me that he'd heard I had a painting by Rembrandt, and he simply had to see it. Could he come for tea? So he came. And he died without even seeing the painting, without even having tea. But, Mr. Chameleon, the poison... The poison was administered some time before he got here. Was that kind of poison? Slow and agonizing. Incidentally, Mr. Hart, uh, why were you so late getting home? Well, after luncheon at the club, I found I had a headache, so uh, I went for a long walk through Central Park. How long? Oh, I'd say roughly two and a half hours. The trouble was I lost all track of time. That uh, wouldn't be much of an alibi if I was suspected of murder. No, that wouldn't be considered an alibi at all. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think I'll go into the next room and question the others to see if they can manage to throw some light on this mystery. Now, Miss Carlyle, don't get excited. Mr. Chameleon, really, this whole thing is just too ghastly for words. I told Charles not to come back from Paris to this ghastly country. I told him not to come and look at any ghastly old painting. Well, they should have listened to you, Miss Carlyle. Though I must say, for a native of Iowa... How did you find out I was born in Iowa? I've worked all my life to lose my Iowa accent. <laughs> and stop laughing at me, Jerry. Who do you think you are? I suppose he thinks he's Charles Van Vogt's nephew, who stands to inherit quite a lot of money. You presume correctly, Mr. Chameleon. And does he need it? He's only 22, but in 22 years, he's piled up enough debt... Shut to... up, Lita. You cheap parasite. Uncle Charles was through with you. You wanted him to marry you, and he didn't want to marry you. Why, you miserable little squirt. Oh, please, please. This is very disillusioning. I had no idea that smart people of the international set talked this way. Well, I'm not going to have this ghastly boy implying that I had any reason to hate poor Charles. Miss Carlyle, where were you between three and five o'clock this afternoon? Now, you said that you met Charles Van Vogt at five at the plaza before you came here to Mrs. Hart's home. Why, yes. Yes, I did, Mr. Chameleon. So did Jerry. And what were both of you doing preceding that appointment? I was window shopping on Fifth Avenue. Mm-hmm. You, Jerry? Uh, I was taking a walk, too, up Broadway through the 50s. Your Uncle Charles Van Vogt sublet a very smart apartment in a remodeled house with no doorman, unfortunately. And this afternoon, somewhere between three and five o'clock, he must have received a visitor who fed him a deadly poison. Now, who could that visitor have been? Well, it wasn't I. And it certainly wasn't I, but Mr. Chameleon, I... Yes, Jerry? Want to tell me something? About uh, Miss Carlyle, for instance? About me? Why me? Because there's something about your name, Miss Carlyle, that's vaguely familiar, quite aside from the fact that you're mentioned in various society columns. So, um, what did you start to say to me, young man? Mm. Nothing. And I didn't go near my uncle's place this afternoon. I was out walking. Yes, so you said. 
You know, it's really quite amazing that so many people should have picked such a cold, windy day to go walking. The point is, Commissioner, not one of those three people has a genuine alibi. They could all have visited Van Vogt's apartment. For the poison, we can't trace it. May have been purchased a long time ago. Well, Chameleon, I grant you that Van Vogt's nephew, Jerry, and Lita Carlyle both had reasons for killing him. Well, not very good reasons. Miss Carlyle, for instance? All right, she was jilted. She couldn't possibly have expected a corpse to marry her, could she? No, and Edward Hart had absolutely no motive at all. He'd only met Van Vogt a few times, casually. He met him first in Europe, in Paris, Van Vogt's own stamping ground. Commissioner, I suspect that is where the answer really lies. In Paris? Mm Mm-hmm. In Van Vogt's past, which I gather was uh, a pretty unsavory past. Now, I wonder who knew Van Vogt and his crowd well enough to make trouble, to tell all, to spill the beans, as we crude Americans would put it. Chameleon, are you planning on taking a trip to Paris to dig up this individual? No, Commissioner, we'll make him come here. In fact, he's already here. D.D. Castlebury is our boy, what? Dee Dee Castlebury. Dale Dudley Castlebury. Dee Dee, for short. An American who's lived most of his life in Paris, very much a member of the international set, gossip monger, refined blackmailer, in a subtle way, of course, nothing common or vulgar. He has a Van Dyke beard and wears a monocle. Oh, who the devil are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about Dee Dee Castlebury. Dee Dee is starting a society column in the Daily Chronicle. Uh, they don't know it yet, however. I'd better tell them. Wait a minute, Chameleon. Do you mean to say you're going to pose as a society columnist? Yes, yes, I am, Commissioner. That's the disguise that I'll take on to try to crack this case. Well. Now, this afternoon, I shall write a series of little notes to Lita Carlyle, to Jerry Van Vogt, to both of the hearts, to everyone, in fact, who had contact with Charles Van Vogt. And in those notes, I shall say that we have mutual friends abroad. I shall hint that I expect to be lavishly entertained. I shall also hint that I know plenty about Van Vogt's past. Mm -hmm. Now, Commissioner, what would you do if you received a note like this? Why, report it to the police since Van Vogt was murdered, and since it certainly sounds like blackmail... Exactly. So whoever doesn't report it probably has something to fear from our friend Didi, which uh, reminds me, Commissioner, I'd like to keep this disguise a secret from Dave Arnold. I have a very definite reason for doing it. Dee Dee Castlebury, what sort of a name is that, Mr. Chameleon? I'm fed up with seeing those posters plastered all over town. Who cares if he's going to write for the Daily Chronicle? Oh, a lot of people may care, Dave. Never can tell. Think we'll have any better luck today with young Jerry Van Vogt? Mm. He's certainly holding out on us. What can we do except go on questioning him? Leader Carlyle, too. You know, there's something about that lady, some piece of information that I cannot put my finger on. Oh, for on. crying out loud, there's another picture of the guy on that billboard. Who? Dee Dee Castlebury. It's enough to drive you nuts. You feel as if he was following you, him and his monocle. Yes, that's the idea of it. What? Hmm? Uh, nothing, Dave. But uh, speaking of being followed, we are being followed. A black limousine has been trailing us for blocks. Are you kidding? No. We're almost there. That's Jerry Van Vogel's hotel done blocked. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Chameleon, they took a shot at you. <coughs> sure did, Dave. Did you get the license number? No, I didn't. They turned the corner too fast. You're okay? They missed you? Yes, yes, they missed me. But that shot jogged my memory. Dave, now I remember when I read Lita Carlyle's name. She's won a lot of contests abroad. She's an expert marksman. Mr. Chameleon and the case of murder from across the seas continues in just a moment. A very important thing to know about genuine Bayer aspirin is that its single active ingredient is so gentle to the system, mothers give it even to small children on their doctor's advice. Always remember this because it means that when you have an ordinary headache, neuritic, or neuralgic pain, you can take Bayer aspirin with complete confidence. For Bayer aspirin gives you more than fast relief. It also gives you the dependable relief that's important to your health. 
Bayer aspirin speed is proved by the fact that it's actually ready to go to work in two seconds. And its dependability is proved by its record of use by millions of normal people without ill effect, a record that no other pain reliever can match. So don't experiment when you're in pain. Don't risk using drugs that have not stood the test of time. Instead, use something that millions know from experience is fast and completely dependable too. Genuine Bayer aspirin. When you buy, ask for it by its full name, Bayer Aspirin, not just for aspirin alone. Get the 100-tablet bottle and you get Bayer Aspirin tablets for less than a penny apiece. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the case of murder from across the seas. It is several days later and in the police commissioner's office, a very unhappy Mr. Chameleon is pacing the floor. And the commissioner says to him with a sort of sympathetic irony, Uh, Chameleon, don't forget that motto of yours. The innocent must be protected, the guilty must be punished. Even if you happen to like the guilty ones. Well, I haven't forgotten it, Commissioner. I'll admit it upsets me that neither Beatrice nor Edward Hart has reported receiving those notes from D.D. Castlebury. Does it upset you more than being shot at? Hmm? Well, you forget I'm used to being shot at. (laughs) Ah, maybe this is it. May I take it? Right ahead. Hello. Hello. Is this Mr. Chameleon? Yes. Mr. Chameleon, this is Beatrice Hart. Yes, Mrs. Hart. I called you to tell you about a very strange note which I received from somebody named Dee Dee Castleberry, who apparently is going to have a society column in the Daily Chronicle. Uh, yes, I, um, I saw his picture this morning. Horrible-looking creature. Uh, Mr. Chameleon, he implied that unless I entertained him and introduced him to my friends, he could make things difficult for me. I have no idea what he's talking about. Also, he mentioned Charles Van Vogt, and I thought you people at police headquarters should be notified immediately. I am very glad you called, Mrs. Hart. You don't know how glad. Tell me, uh, did your husband receive a similar note? Edward? Why, no, he never mentioned it. I see. Uh, Mrs. Hart, do uh, what this Dee Dee Castlebury asks. Entertain him. What? Uh, Give a party for him. Very special party. Uh, Invite... um, Lita Carlyle and Van Vogt's nephew, Jerry, and also a young lady named Madeline Evans. She's a detective like myself. Very attractive girl. I would like to have her keep an eye on this Dee Dee Castlebrand. But what about yourself, Mr. Chameleon? You'll be here at the party. Surely I can count on your being here. Uh, Yes, Mrs. Hart. I think I can safely say that you can definitely uh, count on my being there. Okay, Madeline, is that clear? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. You're to mingle with Mrs. Hart's guest tonight. And only you, my dear, will know that I'm disguised as Dee Dee Castlebrand. But, Mr. Chameleon, what about Dave Arnold? Didn't you tell him that when he got that final data on Charles Van Bogart, he was to bring it to Mrs. Hart's home? Uh, Yes, Madeline, but you will still be the only one who knows me. Charles Van Bogart's murder is extremely shrewd. I'm counting on Dave to help me convince them that Dee Dee Castlebury is genuine. Don't want Dave to know that I am disguised as Castlebrand. Oh, Mr. Castleberry, I can hardly wait to start reading your column. When does it first appear? Uh, on Monday, Miss Carlyle. On Monday, I promise you, I shall startle New York as it has not been startled in years. Oh, goody, goody. Sounds like fun. I beg your pardon, young man. My name is Van Vogt. You claim you knew my Uncle Charles, so naturally you must have known that he had a nephew. I never heard him mention you. I'm not surprised. Did you ever hear him mention me, Mr. Castlebury? Uh, you, uh, Mr. Hart, my gracious host, and incidentally, you and your wife have been most hospitable. Did uh, Charlie Van Vogt ever mention me to you? It would be very surprising if he hadn't. You are a highly successful man, Mr. Hart. But I met him so casually. Did he speak of me favorably? Uh, favorably? Uh, it's so dull to speak favorably of anyone. Uh, pardon me for changing the subject, but who is that attractive girl over there? Well, I don't see any attractive girl. You women are strangely nearsighted when it comes to noticing a pretty girl. That one over there. Oh, uh, that's someone my wife invited, Mr. Casselberry. I believe her name is Madeline Evans. But uh, who's that talking to her? Mr. Hart, it's that detective. Arnold, I think his name is. The one that questioned us with Mr. Chameleon. 
What's a detective doing here? Yes, Mr. Hart, really. Uh, do smart New Yorkers invite detectives to their homes? Mr. Casselberry, you seem to forget Charles Van Vogt died mysteriously here in my home. Uh, yes, yes, so he did. Now, I keep forgetting that this house was so honored. Excuse me, I think I will try to rescue that young lady from the unwelcome attentions of the police, if you'll excuse me. So, here's the final report, Madeline. I'll give it to Mr. Chameleon when I see him, Dave. I'm surprised he isn't here yet. I thought Gendarme! He'd... What? Are you annoying this young lady? I presume you are, so I suggest that you move on. I don't get it. Who are you? My name is Didi Castleberry. At your service, Miss Evans. You see, I have already learned your name. In fact, I have decided to let you call me Didi. A privilege I accord to very few people. Well, that's very nice of you. How do you... Say, wait a minute. You write one of those society gossip columns, don't you? I can't say I care for your tone. But then you neolithic men are always so noisy and tiresome. Come along, my dear. Wait a minute. What kind of men? Dave, please. Keep out of this, Madeline. I think I've been insulted. You most definitely have been. I cannot stand your type. Well, I don't go for you either. Is anything wrong, gentlemen? Oh, Mrs. Hart, uh, do you mind if I ask why you allow these corrupt policemen to invade your home? Corrupt? Now listen, this is more than I can Dave, take. please. Oh. Mr. Castleberry, won't you please come with me out into the hall, please? Very well, Miss Evans. I must say, this man is very tiresome. Will you excuse me, Mrs. Hart? That was quite an argument, Mr. Chameleon. Dave still doesn't recognize you in your disguise as Castleberry. It was perfect, Madeline. If that doesn't convince everyone, nothing will. <laughs> Madeline, what's that lying on my hat and gloves? Well, it's a note. Printed. Addressed to Dee Dee Castleberry. Somebody's ready to do business. Let's see what it says. Dear Mr. Castleberry, if you will meet me in the library at 11 o'clock, I have something very private and important to say to you. All right, Madeline, we'll be there in the library ten minutes ahead of time. Now, let me see that uh, report that Dave brought you. It's 11 o'clock, Mr. Chameleon. Yes, Madeline. You're sure no one can see us behind these curtains? They're extremely heavy curtains. They muffle any sounds as well as concealers. The library door is opening. It's Jerry Van Volkert. Yes. Jerry's been followed by Edward Hart. Mr. Chameleon. Shh, listen. Hello, Jerry. What? Oh. Oh, it's you, Mr. Hart. Yes. But where is your friend, Mr. Castleberry? You expected to meet him, didn't you? I saw you leave that note for him. And what business is it of yours? I've got a right to talk to Mr. Castleberry, haven't I? Talk to him? You mean sell him information, don't you? Maybe I do. That's my business, too. Scandalous information that he'd print in that filthy gossip column of his. Yes, I suppose he would. If he bought it, he'd have a right to use it. Well, Jerry, you're not going to sell it to him. Just try and stop me. Mr. Chameleon, why do you keep watching the door? Shh, quiet, man. Just try and stop me. When Dee Dee Castleberry walks in here, I'll tell him everything I know. So, how about it, Mr. Hart? Is it worth money to you? Is my memory for faces worth a nice fat sum? Because if it no, is... No, don't shoot! Jenny, look out, look out! Uh, drop that gun! Drop that gun! Have you covered? Drop that gun, Mrs. Hart, or we'll have to use ours. Mrs. Hart, what is the use? You might as well confess all the evidence is against you. Quite aside from the fact that just now you also tried to kill Jerry, your nephew by marriage. Mr. Chameleon, stop saying that. I'm married to Edward Hart. Many years ago, you were also married to Charles Van Vogel. He refused to divorce you, so you disappeared. You turned up in New York as Beatrice Carey, and by your beauty and wit, you captured Edward Hart. You married him knowing that you were still married to Van Vogel. And you made up your mind if Van Vogt ever returned here, if he ever threatened your happiness, you would kill him if you had to. So you went to his apartment and gave him poison. Edward, don't let him say such things. Darling, I love you. Whatever you've done, I still love you. <laughs> Indeed he does, Mrs. Hart. He suspected something was wrong. He's been fighting for you desperately, not quite knowing what he was fighting. He realized vaguely that it had something to do with Van Vogt. 
Jerry, the nephew, recognized you, Mrs. Hart. Don't forget. He was ten years old when he last saw you, but he never forgot you. He never forgot his uncle's rage at losing you. Believe me, my dear, you haven't got a chance. It won't be hard now to prove that you were married to Van Vogert, and that when you married Edward Hart, you committed bigamy. So, you confess to everything, Mrs. Hart? Yes, everything, Mr. Comedian. Uh -huh. Even to trying to shoot you on the street. Nothing mattered except keeping the truth from Edward. Certainly the life of a man like Charles Van Vogert didn't matter. Only it did. You cannot take a human life, Mrs. Hart. But you didn't know, Charles. He was horrible. Horrible. And I love Edward so much. You didn't love him enough to try to work this thing out without resorting to violence. You have no pity for me, have you, Mr. Comedian? Mrs. Hart, you were mistaken. At first I couldn't believe it was you. I didn't want to believe it. Yet I suspected it when I found you had no background. You literally sprang out of nowhere. Detective Arnold's report that Van Vogert had once been married clinched it in my mind. You were faced with a tragic problem, and you found... A tragic solution. I have great pity for you and great sympathy for Edward Hart. But the fact remains that I am a policeman and you took a human life. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. There's nothing as important as fast relief when you have an ordinary headache, neuritic, or neuralgic pain. And millions who want very fast relief use Bayer Aspirin, for Bayer Aspirin is ready to go to work almost instantly. Within two seconds after you take it, it starts to disintegrate, and that's why relief comes so quickly. Remember this, and remember, too, that Bayer Aspirin is one thing you can take with complete confidence. We say this because no other pain reliever can match Bayer Aspirin's record of use by millions of normal people without ill effect. So for fast, reliable relief from headache or the pains of neuritis or neuralgia, use genuine Bayer Aspirin. And when you buy, ask for it by its full name, Bayer Aspirin, never by the name Aspirin alone. Get the 100-tablet bottle and you get Bayer Aspirin tablets for less than a penny apiece. <laughs> Listen next Wednesday night at the same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces, in The Case of the Fatal Impersonation. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson, with dialogue by Marie Balmer, from the original story by Frank and Anne Hummert. Music directed by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. Attention, everyone. All this week, your druggist is featuring a special combination offer of a large-sized tube of new Lion's toothpaste and a superb quality Tech toothbrush. The list price for both is 79 cents. But during this sensational bargain offer, you can get both for only 59 cents. So to save money, to get a combination that's tops for cleaning and brightening teeth, take advantage of this Lion's toothpaste Tech Toothbrush Offer that gives you a 79-cent value for only 59 cents. Listen for Mr. Chameleon in The Case of the Fatal Impersonation next Wednesday night at this time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>